My name is Tim Marshall. I've been engineering test solutions at Xbox Game Studios for about 10 years, and I'm joined today by my colleague, Evie Macklin, so that we may introduce a novel validation process that leverages client telemetry to automatically test gameplay scenarios. In the next half hour, we will discuss the current state of testing in our industry, what exactly we mean when we say passive validation, and share examples of impact from the Forza Motorsport and Age of Empires franchises. Before diving in, we'd like to share the mission statement of Studios Quality, which is our organization within Xbox Game Studios. We partner with studios to enable continuous delivery of high quality game experiences that players love. Everything we do is dedicated to fulfilling this mission. And as new games press the envelope in terms of size, complexity, and long-term strategy, we must innovate new solutions to test more efficiently while maintaining the same level of confidence in our game's quality. With that said, let's look at how games are generally tested today. Modern game testing has evolved beyond relying solely on manual testers. And when I say manual tester, I mean um, a tester with a controller in her hands, running test cases in the game all day, every day, trying to find and file bugs. Perhaps the most prolific game testing pattern is known as the test pyramid, which you can see on the right side of the slide. Considered the ideal test pyramid, you'll see that teams will implement layers of automation, including unit tests, integration tests, and end-to-end -end tests, so that manual testers may be freed up to do what they do best use their talent and experience to find creative ways to break the game. We call this exploratory testing, and it's the antithesis of directed functional test cases. Consider the first-person shooter Halo 5. An example of a functional test case would be to launch the campaign to a specific level, traverse the map to a unique weapon location, have the player pick up the weapon, and make sure it can be equipped. While it's important to make sure this functionality works, it feels like a waste of resources to have an actual person physically complete this test case on a regular basis to ensure that the system doesn't break with future check-ins. Unfortunately for most teams, the reality is far from ideal. As you can see here, we flip the ideal pyramid upside down into what looks like an ice cream cone. This can happen for any number of reasons, but the important takeaway is that a team operating within this format will spend most of their test budget to have an army of expensive manual testers find simple functional bugs. So with that in mind, you'd think all we need to do is avoid flipping the test pyramid. While good development practices that encourage automation and quality at the source will get you most of the way there, a major trend in gaming has introduced a wide opening for innovation. I'm talking about games as a service, sometimes called GAS. This is the idea that developers no longer follow the traditional pattern of shipping a title, releasing some DLC, and then moving on to another game. With games as a service, devs are looking to introduce games that are continuously updated for years to build large, engaged user bases. This trend of continuously growing games makes testing more complex. Not only does a test team need to test new features, but they need to ensure that already shipped features still work. That is to say, the scope of responsibility, test responsibility grows as the game grows, despite a usually static, non-moving test budget. Now I'll hand the reins over to Evie, who will speak to an innovative test process we call passive validation. Thanks, Tim. So how do we start to flip that pyramid back the right way? Well, the first and most important step is to expand the coverage of our automated tests especially those that can run passively. This is where our approach to telemetry-driven passive validation comes in. In short, these are test cases that we use telemetry to validate instead of traditional methods. Every single person who touches the game generates telemetry. If we can make that data go to work for us, we can design test cases with unprecedented amounts of coverage, since all users have the ability to contribute, whether they even realize it or not. And it also allows you to scale your test force in the same way that you would scale your title's user base whether that's by running a closed beta or flight or post-release unleashing an update on millions of Game Pass users, there's no need to waste time onboarding a bunch of testers. And this approach is especially valuable um, for two classes of test case, 
The first are cases that require either extensive manual testing, so human hours we don't have or wish we could use in other areas. And the second class consists of test cases that we just can't test by hand. These typically require either complete coverage of a test area, or so that's knowledge of every single occurrence of a specific gameplay action, or they need to be run way more often than our test teams can support. What we then get out of passive tests is, as usual, bugs. Um, but since telemetry is able to cover every single game session, we can also use passive validation to have complete confidence that areas of our game are working as intended. And that bit is pretty magical if you ask me. After an initial engineering investment, these test cases run every day or at whatever cadence effectively for free. And this is critical in our era of games as a service and constant content updates. Consider this simplified view of test team size over the life of a title. Um, as a game gets closer to release and general access, the test team expands to meet the demand of bugs being filed. After launch, the test team shrinks in response to reduced need. As the industry moves closer to games as a service, however, the need for testers never really goes away for the life of the title. Given enough budget, the test team continues to expand to cover new test areas while maintaining coverage of all the previous test areas. Our greatest tool in combating this is found in our users who, right at the moment where our test teams are overwhelmed by covering both the existing feature set and the influx of new content, our users are ready to do their part by generating telemetry. By leveraging their data for passive validation, we're able to test more content with fewer resources, all of which translates to better player experiences. And that's what Xbox Game Studios is all about. So what does this whole passive validation thing look like practically? This error represents the data flow or basic components of a telemetry driven test case. It starts with people playing your game. This could be developers, testers, flighting participants, anyone with access to a build really. And as they play, they generate telemetry. We can then take that telemetry and run it through some kind of logic that generates test results and report those results just like we would for a traditional test case. And many of these steps are already part of our testing and development process. What makes the development of these test cases a little different is the engineering involved in implementing test case logic and, of course, the infrastructure to then run those tests. Tim will talk about this more in a moment, but we use a few Azure services to ensure we can run these tests at scale. And what makes this passive is we don't even need to think about the gameplay and telemetry components. And depending on your reporting method, that can be a passive component as well. All that said, there's a significant piece of the puzzle we can't quite fit on the arrow, and that's the process of actually defining the test case. This is a highly collaborative process that should involve everyone from test area managers to designers and developers. We want to make sure these test cases deliver value to our partners. And working with these stakeholders gives us an idea of which areas to tackle first. And the faster we can free manual testers from a task, the sooner we can get to new tests and increase confidence in more areas of our game. But just as important as asking the right questions and finding impactful test cases is making sure we actually have the necessary telemetry to address the test case. Not only does it need to exist, but it needs to be reliable and we need to make sure that the data actually represents what we think it represents. And that bit is not an easy step. I can't tell you how many telemetry bugs I've filed in the process of developing these test cases. So depending on where you are in the development cycle, this could also be an opportunity to have influence over the kind of telemetry your game produces. I'll give a more concrete example of this later, but as soon as you're able to demonstrate the impact of passive validation to your partners, that gives you a ton of leverage to get the telemetry changes you need to implement even more test cases. Now, I know that was all pretty abstract and high level, so I'm going to pass it back to Tim to give you a specific example from Forza and talk a bit about the implementation of a passive validation system. Our first example centers around the simulation car racing franchise, Forza Motorsport. We will show how we passively validate the quality of Forza's AI opponent drivers. Following the pattern Evie described, we collect gameplay telemetry, analyze it, and report on the results. For this example, I will focus on the telemetry and logic portions of the system. So there are many different types of telemetry today, uh, but we're going to ignore all of the business intelligence stuff and focus on gameplay. We define custom game telemetry or custom game events as data that is sent from the game whenever certain in-game events occur. So something like uh, in Forza, a car select event firing when a player selects a car. We capture this data in real time with Azure PlayFab's data analytics service. 
PlayFab is an integral piece of the Microsoft Game Stack, offering a complete backend platform for live games with managed services, real-time analytics, and live ops. Our game telemetry is processed by PlayFab and accessed through Azure Data Explorer using Cousteau, which is a SQL-like big data query language. With complete control of the data we collect and easy access to that data, we're ready to move on to the next step, the logic. We split our logic into two categories of implementation, simple query tests and managed code tests. A simple query test is exactly what it says. It's a test that validates the results of a query. We generate these queries programmatically based on tester-defined configurations. An example of this would be to test the top speed that players can achieve in a race. If a player hits a speed that should be impossible, we would fail the test case. Configuring this would be as easy as selecting the event that we want to look at, race complete, the feature we want to test, top speed, and an allowable threshold, say 400 miles per hour. Our system would then generate and run Cousteau queries to test the scenario on a recurring schedule. Sometimes this isn't actually enough. Sometimes we need to implement more complex cases and look beyond query languages to use managed code. These are tests that cannot be evaluated through simple queries and require deeper data manipulation. Now let's take a look at the layout of our system. All right, so what you see here is a high level overview of our system. We use Azure Data Factory to orchestrate access to data sources, um, run test pipelines, and to handle our test results. ADF is good at moving data and is more accessible than other tools. It actually has a, uh, a pretty fancy drag and drop UI that's relatively intuitive. It also has connectors that allow us to incorporate Azure functions and Databricks scripts right into our pipelines. Basically, the system works by connecting to a variety of data sources and running a suite of tester configured ADF pipelines to generate test results and consume them through Power BI reports to send email alerts. These these results not only increase our confidence of validated features, but also naturally provide a level of guidance for our manual testers. Those folks are then enabled to investigate failures and understand what areas of the game they should test next. I do also want to bring your attention to the list of motorsport data sources on the right side of the slide. In addition to PlayFab game telemetry, which we collect in internally and in our retail environment, we also connect to our SQL performance database, local game files, and really any other data source that we need. Systems like this have the most impact when you save on manual resources or when you are able to test features that are very difficult for humans to test on their own. Features like Forza's in-game AI opponents. It is very difficult to manually test the driving quality of our AI opponents. And in this context, AI is not referring to machine learning. We're talking about the computer-controlled opponents that players race against. Forza Motorsport packs hundreds of cars, many real-world laser scan racetracks, and different physics-affecting weather conditions. For each track, car, weather condition combination, we must test it individually, which creates a massive content matrix that is basically untenable to test manually. Even if the matrix was smaller, driving a bugs, AI bugs are difficult to detect with the human eye. Testers must watch computer opponents race around the track over and over, um, just watching them, trying to find little differences from race to race. Wouldn't it be better to just test all of this automatically with our data? As one of our first passive validation cases, we set up a straightforward pipeline uh, that primarily leverages Databricks. We then created a specialized PlayFab telemetry event to log the data we need to measure driver AI performance. Now, back when we implemented this test, we didn't have enough internally collected data, so we used test hooks to automate hot laps for the entire content matrix. A hot lap is when a driver is alone on a track, just simply just doing laps over and over, trying to race as fast as they can. We collect data from hundreds of these hot laps for every individual scenario, 
and use a generic Python function to generate statistics that test our different KPI measures. We then ingest the results back into Azure Data Explorer, transform the data with Cousteau, and report the results with Power BI to find bugs. This is an example of the Python function we use to generate our stats. While I've cut out the guts of the function itself, the idea is that all you need to do to get the stats you care about is define a source table, define a series of fields to group by, and define a feature to aggregate. Then we spit the results back into Cousteau. Keeping our functions generic like this allows us to easily implement similar tests for other gameplay features with very little overhead. So once the results are in Cousteau, the core test owner for driving AI loads the data into this Power BI report to identify bugs. By generating stats associated with the driving spline, the lap time, and car width percentage, we passively find three categories of bugs. Really, this serves two purposes. It identifies the bugs themselves, and it details out the scenarios where the bugs occur. Those details, which I've mostly grayed out here, um, help testers investigate and help developers to implement fixes. This passive validation test case has drastically reduced the manual effort to test forces driving AI. It's actually been reduced to the point where testers now only take a manual approach when they are investigating bugs that are already highlighted by the report. If I haven't convinced you of the power of passive validation by now, perhaps Evie will as she introduces our next example. It's been really cool to see the kind of impact this project has had on the Forza team and the Forza product. So, hello again. I've had the privilege of implementing passive validation on the next Age of Empires game, and I'd like to share with you the very first test case we put together for that title. If you're not familiar with the Age franchise, AOE is a real-time strategy game where over the course of a few short matches, um, you try and defeat your opponents by dominating them with your military forces or other map-dependent win conditions. And the more you play RTS games like AOE, the more you realize that resource availability, but also map topography are the determining factors in how you play a match. Topography is laid out by our map designers and we trust that they've done their due diligence to ensure maps play as they intend. Um, but resources are distributed by a black box algorithm that really only a few developers understand the inner workings of. And because of this, resource distribution can fail or more accurately not meet the requirements set out by our designers. We've identified two main ways they can fail. Either the overall resource distribution tips the scales in favor of one player, therefore against the others, or starting resources are missing or improperly allocated, effectively doing players before the match even starts. And this is a very difficult area of the game to test. We have over 25 maps, a variety of biomes, map sizes, difficulty levels. There are at least 4,000 different configurations that affect resource distribution, and we can't really leave any of them behind. That makes both of these resource failure states prime territory for passive validation, and we've actually developed solutions for both of them. In, this today's, in today's talk, however, we'll just be focusing on the second one, which is starting resources. After working with our designers, we were able to come up with specific criteria for each player's starting resources. On screen right now, we have three mini-maps from Age of Empires side by side, showing player spawn locations and resource deposits. These indicate three of the many possible, well, infinite really, states we might come across in gameplay. And actually, the buggy matches I'm about to show are uncovered by your passive validation system, not manual testers. So on the left in blue-green, all is well. The blue icon represents the player's spawn point, and the icons within that circle match what we expect to see. In the middle, however, the blue player is missing key resources, like gold and food. Even the stone is just barely in range. Meanwhile, their opponent in red has everything they need to thrive and crush the blue player. In an even more extreme case on the right, resource distribution has failed completely and no one has access to anything. Both of these are terrible player experiences and we want to detect and ultimately eliminate them. In order to detect these cases via telemetry, we need two data points, where the resources are and where the players spawn. And thankfully, our pre-existing telemetry made finding resource positions easy, and that should have been the case for player spawn positions as well, but there was a bug in the telemetry. And I bring this up because I want to highlight the importance of involving your developer partners in the process. 
Since play response weren't actually being used by anyone, no one had checked beyond the basics to make sure they were working as intended. And after putting together a proof of concept with a fairly unattractive workaround, I was able to demonstrate the impact of this data and push for a fix, which eliminated my dependence on those extra telemetry events. So with those two pieces squared away, I had all the data I needed to address the test case. And from there, I could implement the logic that the designers and I settled on in code. And over on Age of Empires, we're using a very similar system to the one Tim discussed, so I'll skip over the details, but feel free to reach out if you're interested. On a nightly schedule, the system runs through the telemetry from that day's matches, checks for each player's starting resources, and stores the passes and failures back into Kusto, which brings us to the reporting step. And at this point, we have a list of passes and failures stored in a database, and the world is kind of our oyster for how it comes to communicating that data. For the ultimate passive experience, we could set up a service to file the bugs directly into Azure DevOps or file off email alerts if we pass a certain threshold of failures. But since this test case didn't concern anything particularly urgent and, um, and I wanted more control over the narrative of the data, so to speak, I chose to communicate my results in the form of a Power BI report, much like Tim. And I needed this report to do two things. First, provide big picture results with an opportunity to dive deeper into the data and understand the underlying causes. But I also wanted to provide enough additional data and context for others to go back and reproduce the listed bugs. I'm sure you all know how developers feel about bugs with no repro steps. So this report here is what we came up with. You're looking at page one, which covers a lot of the high level data. And this top bar gives a quick snapshot of how we're doing by resource across all matches. And this table here is what got our map designers particularly excited. Each row in this table represents a match and each failure is highlighted by resource. And if you were to scroll across the table, you would also see all the data points a person needs to go back to their own machine and reproduce this map in game, which is hugely powerful. And this last section here is the first step in determining trends in the data and which bugs we actually need to file. As I mentioned earlier, there are thousands and thousands of different combinations of map settings that influence resource distribution. And this visual searches through every combination of resource, map, and biome, which that alone covers almost a thousand of those combinations. I want you to imagine going to your test team and saying, hey, I need you to test a thousand different scenarios every single day for the life of this title. I'm not sure how they'd feel about that one. Anyways, uh, another key piece is the second page where all these success rates are broken down by map. Since map choice is the primary influencer in how resources are distributed, this view gives a much more targeted approach to the results. We can find out things like maps 5 and 15 are, well, they have some pretty consistent issues, but we can also see that maps like 7, 20, and 23 have never failed to date. And both of those are equally valuable insights. Some bonus insights, though, are that reports from telemetry test cases double as coverage reports. For example, we can learn things like map 14 has over 6,000 matches on it, but the rest of the maps have less than a few hundred. Why is that? Well, in short, this is the default map you get when you open up a game, and our testers have had no reason to change the map if their test doesn't depend on it. And since this is a map with high success rates, this should be an incentive to switch up our testing practices and better cover the game space in day-to-day -day testing. We can also see that this map over here has zero matches, which confirmed suspicions we had that no one has ever been able to successfully play a match on this map. And this is especially interesting as we leave the controlled testing environment and hand out builds to flight users where that kind of insight is virtually impossible to discover. So, that pretty much wraps up my example for Age of Empires, but I want to take these last few moments to really drive home the fact that passive validation is a high value investment and a critical piece to how we scale quality efforts in our games. With the support of our starting resources report, testers are free to set that area aside completely and move on to other things, increasing the areas we're able to test before release and lessening the burden on our testers post release. We're also able to leverage the experience of our most important stakeholders, the players, um, to continuously monitor and maintain the quality of our matches, effectively for free, as long as there are players interested in the game. And in the case of Age of Empires, we hope that's a very long time. So if you're seeing the value of passive validation and want to bring this kind of impact to your own games, Tim and I are here to help. Uh, we'll see you in the chat for Q&A in a few minutes, but we'd love to chat with you individually after the session and beyond. So thank you all for listening, and we'll see you. We look forward to interacting with you in the chat.